All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dean Miller. Uh, I am the president of Whole Health Pharmacy Partners. And uh, welcome to our first webinar of the season. Um, for those of you that have joined us before, I think you know that uh, we're very active on the webinar circuit. We, we do a lot of these. We love doing them and we like, uh, for the most part, we like having everybody, um, you know, across the country, having these available to everybody. So um, tonight our topic is, you know, a lot of people might think the acronym WTF is a little bit different, but tonight it's gonna mean what the flu. So uh, what we're going to do is we're gonna introduce to you our new uh, flu shot program for, for 2020, 2021. Uh, and we're also gonna dive into the topic because um, certainly this year, uh, as pharmacists were complicated, or it's become a little bit more complicated with uh, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic underway. So we're gonna kind of dive into what we feel are the best precautions, the best advice that we could possibly um, give to you. And hopefully a few new tidbits that maybe you didn't pick up through the various um, communications across the country, uh, through the various, um, associations and whatnot. So um, without further ado, I am going to introduce our, our speakers tonight. Uh, like I said, my name is Dean Miller. I'm, I'm the president and CEO of, of uh, Full Health, but more importantly, our two speakers tonight are more than qualified to talk to the topic. Um, first and foremost, Tiana Tilly. Tiana is our Director of Pharmacy Innovation and Professional Affairs. Um, and also James Morrison, our Director of Pharmacy Excellence, which is another way of saying central operations. So uh, we're going to hit flu from a couple angles tonight. Uh, Tiana, more from an informational um, perspective on what you need to know. James, more on an operational perspective on what you need to know. So as you can see, uh, two very uh, qualified speakers to the topic tonight. Um, and with that, um, let's let's get going on the topic. Uh, but before we um, before we go on, um, James, you want to advance the next slide, please? Um, tonight, uh, this influenza webinar is made possible through uh, the support of two worthy organizations. The first one uh, being our friends at Snoopy Pasture. Um, they've helped us out many times in the past with our webinars. So we're very grateful to Sanofi for their sponsorship tonight. Um, uh, and then also De Novo Home Healthcare and Wellness is our co-sponsor tonight. Um, one thing you might want to note is just on the bottom, um, there's something you might kind of go, who's that? And it says Novaris down there. Um, Novaris is actually a device that um, uh, we feel very strongly about at Whole Health, and uh, you know it's a it's a basically it's something that many of you could utilize in your pharmacy or if you're in a pharmacy clinic combination uh, to help keep patients safe, uh, keep the air safe and clean uh, in the facility uh, during COVID-19. So um, if anyone has any questions about that, maybe make a note of it now and say you know, email Dean or email James at the end of this presentation and we'll, we'll get into it a little bit more. But once again, our two sponsors tonight, very grateful to Sanofi Pasture and, and De Novo Home Healthcare and Wellness. So with that, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it back to James uh, to get us, uh, get us going. So James, Tiana, right. the show is yours. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dean, for that introduction. And one thing I want to add to the introduction, for folks that don't know Whole Health, what we are is an independent pharmacy banner. So we, we provide a lot of support to independent pharmacy owners, and we are available coast to coast. Although the majority of our 70 pharmacies are in Ontario, we do have pharmacies now in Alberta, in Saskatchewan and soon will be also in British Columbia and New Brunswick. So uh, if you're out there in a different part of the country and you like what you're seeing, please let us know, reach out and uh, say hello. 
So uh, Dean already kind of touched on the agenda for tonight, but uh, I'll touch on it again. We'll start with a bit of an overview of influenza, but then we're going to dive right into COVID proofing your pharmacy. So how can you provide immunization services safely in the midst of this pandemic? We'll look at some diff at the different options we have for influenza vaccines and what's available in which provinces and what you can do to offer vaccines even outside of public programs. We'll get into what's new with flu, um, looking at changes to programs across the country. And uh, at the end, we'll have some operational considerations as a wrap up and some Q&A. So if you've got questions, please uh, make sure you put them into the chat box. Or if you're watching this on Facebook Live, you can put it into the comments and uh, we'll be sure to get to as many as we can. So starting with an overview of influenza, I think I'm gonna pass this off to Dr. Tilly. Thank you, Tiana. Thanks, James. So we know that influenza, along with pneumonia, is in the top 10 causes of death in Canada each year, um, and that there's over 40,000 cases that were reported in 2019 to 2020, and, and this may even be underreported um, based on people who may not actually end up seeking care for it. We know that it puts a strain on our healthcare system, even on years where there isn't COVID. So we've seen things like 12,000 hospitalizations, and again, a big impact on morbidity and mortality with many deaths per year in Canada as well. We also know that influenza happens um, for a lot of months throughout the year, not just in the winter months. So we wanna start immunizing patients in October, which a lot of pharmacies are already doing since the rollout was nice and early this year. And keep doing this as the influenza season peaks in January and February, but even immunizing into March and April, um, if a patient hasn't been immunized by that point, there's still some benefit they can get. And so we still want to immunize them. Now, we also know that it's really important to immunize against influenza because there's a lot of influenza-related complications. And these are higher amongst high-risk populations, for example, adults over 65, Indigenous peoples, pregnant women, um, people with comorbidities. Um, so we really want to make sure we immunize them. They're at risk for direct effects of influenza, so those are respiratory effects, and also indirect effects, so things that might trigger cardiac complications um, or exacerbations of things like renal uh, disorders or diabetes. And in this season in particular, we have the mix of influenza and COVID. And so these are both respiratory illnesses and they have some similarities. So it might be hard for patients to differentiate which they might be experiencing and even healthcare providers to differentiate. We know that their symptoms include things like fever, cough, respiratory difficulties and shortness of breath. Um, as well as overall fatigue. So it can be hard to say which they're experiencing and then might require hospitalization um, to, to suss that out. Um, it can also be transmitted in similar fashions, which is good and bad news. So we know respiratory droplets, um, which can then be transmitted as we touch surfaces or even shake hands with people and then touch mucous membranes. That can be a way for uh, transmission to occur. Now, I say that this is a good and bad thing. I think in this season in particular, people are hyper aware of transmission of COVID. And so they're taking precautions, which I think will also then protect them from influenza to some extent. Um, but it also still means that they're at risk for both of these uh, going into the fall. We also have the same patients, so that 60 plus, 65 plus crowd and the patient populations with chronic comorbidities who are going to be at higher risk. So we really want to protect them because if we look at influenza um, occurring in the fall and a second wave of COVID occurring, that's where we really see the impact on the healthcare system that might already be at capacity. And so we need to really make sure that we prevent influenza as much as we can so that we have as many beds in the hospital and ICU um, as available as much as possible for cases of COVID that might happen. 
Now, the most effective way of preventing influenza, and luckily we have one of these, is an influenza vaccine. So on top of encouraging other measures like washing hands, uh, respiratory etiquette, like sneezing in the elbow, and staying home and distancing when sick, we really want to stress the importance of influenza vaccines. And I think the Canadian population, like we saw in the CPHA survey that showed that a third of Canadians are reporting that they're definitely getting their flu shot specifically because of concerns about COVID. And so we can make sure we work with patients while they have that interest to get their flu shots especially as we wait for a potential COVID-19 vaccine. And we know the benefits of this are that we can protect patients from getting ill, they can protect other loved ones, even those who may not be able to be immunized. We can keep their lungs healthy, which is especially important as um, COVID-19 is also a respiratory illness. And then, like I mentioned, we avoid those hospitalizations and healthcare visits to really maintain the healthcare system's capacity into the second wave of COVID. Thank you, Tiana. So I'm going to start us off with a video telling a story about uh, one patient's journey with influenza and how it changed their life entirely. And um, another interesting aspect of this story is this gentleman's son is a pharmacist um, and his name is Umberto Leone and the patient in the story is Mike Leone. And Mike worked in pharmacies for about 40 years and uh, and his son Umberto actually works part-time at one of our whole health pharmacies and I think that Umberto does a really eloquent job of sharing this story so I'm very pleased that we can share it with you here. I was 18. I started to work on customers. I was 18. I started to work on construction, plastering, candy steel. I used to do everything. Then I worked in the pharmacy for 40 years. This was the one year where, unfortunately, he was one of the individuals who contracted influenza and it put him in the hospital for nine months influenza is not just a bad cold. It is a cascade of shutdown. When the cardiovascular arrest, he had two bacterial pneumonias. He experienced sepsis, I went into acute renal failure, acute liver failure, had a tracheostomy done. In his case, the big changes were uh, social life. I was going to senior club every day. Now, all gone. Anything where I have to go now is hard. I am not Mike Leon anymore. There have been uh, changes in the home. Everything had to be redone. It's all first floor living. The washroom and the ramp. I probably would have never thought that the flu would have done something like this, let alone somebody I know. I hope that people make objective, evidence-based decisions regarding the influenza vaccine and vaccines in general for themselves and their loved ones. So um, yeah, I think that really sums it up how we need to consider flu differently. I think a lot of folks don't see it for the serious illness that it can be for some folks. So yeah, gonna... completely... I was just gonna say I completely agree, James. Like I think we can see by the story that especially in the adult 65 plus, it can affect things like their, their health and cause complications. and it also affects their quality of life after they have influenza um, and their family who has to care for them potentially afterwards. So we really wanna to try to immunize um, this patient population and protect them as much as we can. 
Yeah, it looks like the Facebook live stream stopped. So I'm just going to try and send it out again. Um, just take me a moment. So in the meantime, I'm going to put up a poll question. So please, people who are listening in, have a look at our poll question and submit an answer if you can. So the question was, which influenza strains tend to cause more severe outcomes in adults 65 years and over? And the answers, it looks like about a third of people said influenza B and about two thirds said uh, influenza A. So we'll get into the answer to that question shortly. <laughs> so uh, let me just, Take a minute. I think it's important pharmacists understand exactly what's in the flu vaccine when they're having conversations with patients because you'll see in the media there's a lot of talk about the seniors flu shot and those patients are going to come into the pharmacy and ask you what is this seniors flu shot. So it's important that we all have a good understanding of the differences between the standard dose which we call QIV or quadrivalent compared to the high dose which is trivalent or TIV. So within the high dose trivalent, there's three strains. It protects against three strains of influenza. Two of them are influenza A strains and one influenza B strain. And if we compare that to, and they're, they're at higher concentration. So um, because of those uh, antigens being present in four times stronger concentration, it is, it, it's been found to elicit stronger immune responses compared to uh, the regular amount of antigen that you find in standard dose vaccines. And if we compare to the standard dose vaccine that's out there this year, we know that there's two strains of influenza A and two strains of influenza B that it provides protection against. Now we know that this is especially important for adults 65 and older, and, and that's because the immune system naturally wanes as we age. So older adults need a higher antigen content to mount a greater immune response and get more protection. Um, so that's why the four times the antigen concentration in the high dose trivalent vaccine can help them mount a greater response. This is important to know too, because some patients under 65 might ask for this uh, vaccine, even if they aren't immunocompromised, just because they've heard about it and it has more. Um, and so you want to talk to them about the fact that you're under 65 and so your immune system can naturally mount a response, um, whereas the older patients need a bit more of that antigen to help them boost that immune response. One thing that also comes up, like James highlighted, is that the high-dose trivalent has the two influenza A, but only one influenza B um, strains that are covered, whereas the standard-dose quadrivalent has the two influenza A and two influenza B. And the reason why we still feel comfortable recommending this vaccine, the high-dose trivalent to adults 65 and older, is because we know for them, influenza A strain protection is really important. And that's because it tends to cause the more severe outcomes in adults 65 and older. We even know that in studies that compared the high-dose trivalent vaccine to the standard-dose trivalent vaccine, um, immunization with the high-dose trivalent vaccine resulted in 24% fewer influenza illnesses. So that's something to keep in mind as well. In some provinces, the standard is the standard-dose quadrivalent, and we don't yet have studies on that front. Um, but looking at the trivalent high dose, uh, we see that additional protection. Thank you, Tiana. And so this, this next Tiana, slide. Um, Tiana, we had one question. You sort of answered part, uh, portion of it during the uh, 
your answer. But uh, Samar asks, wondering if any studies show if there's a significant benefit in the high dose versus standard. Many of my patients want the high dose, but as usual, the supply is very low, and I feel waiting two weeks now to see if it comes in is risky versus just getting the standard one. Your thoughts? Yeah, so, so you're, you're beating James right to this point here where he's actually going to... Um, He's going to talk uh, about some of the things to consider, but one thing that we definitely want to talk to patients about is making that um, patient-centered choice and, and having that discussion with them so that they can make um, the decision that's right for them. Um, having that additional protection, especially in the 65-year-old patient population and older is really important. However, if it becomes inaccessible, it's the patient's choice to say, okay, is it realistic that I might get immunized later in the season with the high dose trivalent? Um, if not, if it's somebody who maybe won't have access to the healthcare system or it's a region or a province where um, the high dose is in high demand and isn't going to be accessible, um, then we need to make sure that they're at least immunized. So we don't want to delay so much while we wait that they're at risk earlier in the season, um, but making sure that if you do provide the standard quadrivalent vaccine or standard trivalent, if that's the standard of care in your province or jurisdiction, that the patient is clear on which vaccine they've received. You really want to make sure that that patient is engaged in the conversation and that they know if they received the standard dose quadrivalent or the high dose trivalent. Um, Otherwise, you might get patients who are very upset when they thought they were getting the high dose vaccine, but actually got the standard dose vaccine. Yeah, that's excellent advice, Tiana. And we've seen it and we've heard about that where patients went to the pharmacy and thought they were getting one vaccine and then they actually received something different. So I think it's important that we try and have these conversations with patients just to make sure they're informed um, of what they're getting for some reason patients are quite passionate about which flu shot they get, and that's great that they're so interested in, in being protected against the flu, but just making sure patients are aware of their options. And I think one of the key messages of this webinar is ensuring that you know patients are immunized as soon as possible. Um, so not to delay for weeks, if that's when you're expecting a particular vaccine will come available, and to offer them whichever uh, you have, because we know it takes a couple of weeks to mount an immune response. And that's especially true, perhaps earlier in the season, you might um, think, okay, I'm able to reorder at a certain date so I can schedule my patients, especially the high risk that I've identified, maybe through a pharmacy dispensing software query um, and schedule them in so you're high dose vaccines are allocated to them. Um, but if it becomes later in the season and you don't even know if you're going to get any more high dose, um, that's not something we wanna risk them going unimmunized for. Um, the other thing to do is um, see if they are able to access the high dose potentially through other resources, if other areas might have it, if that's what's best for the patient. Yeah, there's another question there, and it's how do I access high dose in Alberta? So you'll see when we get to a slide later on that Alberta, the high dose for the public plan is only available for long-term care. So pharmacy has a limited role in providing high dose for um, patients for the public plan. But um, we're hoping that there will be supply of high dose vaccine in wholesalers soon. So if you're able to order that, we'll talk about how you can provide that outside of the public plan to patients willing to pay or have insurance. And it's important not to assume that a patient won't be able to pay, even if um, this might have been an issue in other items or they don't have private coverage. Um, a lot of patients actually feel really passionate about this. And when they look at the potential complications and costs associated with that, things like we saw installing ramps, um, requiring additional home and healthcare devices, time off work for themselves and their family members, um, they might actually be willing to invest in their 
high dose vaccine or in another non publicly funded vaccine. So having that conversation and, and letting them decide, especially when they find out about things like that opportunity cost that might exist. Yeah, so um, I know we've already talked quite a lot about these two vaccine options, but we're going to try and get through this slide and, and carry on through the presentation. So both vaccines are high dose and standard dose are safe for seniors and certainly are indicated for seniors. We talked about how the high dose trivalent conveys better protection against influenza A strains. And we're particularly concerned about those strains when we're talking about our senior patients over 65 years of age. And we know that, uh, I know Tiana talked about this already, how influenza A is associated with a greater disease burden in our senior patients. And uh, that burden is even, not only it's a higher burden, but also more serious cases we know that the QIV, so the standard dose, offers protection against the same strains contained in the high dose TIV and includes an additional B strain. And uh, influenza B occurs less commonly in our senior patients, 65 and over. So the point of the, all of this is to say, you know, have, have these conversations with patients. Don't make assumptions. Um, if you're able to get some of the high dose vaccine, um, and there might be interest from patients either to pay for it or use their own insurance or um, health spending accounts. And try and get ahead of this with identifying those patients that are particularly passionate or interested in the high dose flu vaccine so that you can have a list. And then if you have enough patients to order that pack of five doses, um, it might go a long way in, you know, securing that patient relationship and making everybody uh, feel comfortable with flu season and protecting as many folks as you can. Yeah. And if you aren't able to get the high dose vaccine, you can still talk to patients about the NACI recommendations um, that do say it's reasonable to use either the high dose trivalent or the standard dose quadrivalent in adults 65 plus. So they can still um, benefit from the standard dose quadrivalent vaccine if that's what's available um, and uh, we would immunize them with that. Yeah, I wanted to put up this slide about pharmacist scope with providing injections in particular around influenza because I think this is the first year where every province and um, one of our territories is able to provide flu vaccines at pharmacies so it's a big deal. Um, and you can see the age groups vary from province to province. Most of them are around five years old. Pharmacists are able to provide injections. In BC, as young as two years old, pharmacists can give the intranasal and five and up for injections. Uh, if you look to Nova Scotia, they're starting immunizing two years and up this year. And they are also utilizing pharm pharmacy technicians to delegate the active injecting to the technicians. and those technicians that are participating have started their training this October. So it's a very interesting things happening across the country. One misconception I hear a lot from pharmacists and doctors here in Ontario is, I wait a minute, I thought you guys could do two years to five years now. And in fact, we cannot. There was consultation done on that regulation and it's sitting with the ministry for them to decide when it becomes in force. So looks like this flu season, we will not be immunizing patients as young as two and in Ontario, it's only five and up. So I'm gonna spend some time talking to you all about how to uh, COVID proof your immunization service or your flu shot service. Oh, there's a, one question. What happened to the live intranasal vaccine this season? Is it no longer recommended? We're gonna talk about that a little bit later on about um, what's happening with that across the country. So uh, stay tuned for that, please. So following NACI's recommendations and we're coming out strong as a banner this year, encouraging our stores to optimize the immunization encounters. So because we're doing appointment booked flu shots, it's a real opportunity 
to assess patients for their other uh, immunizations that they might require. And we also know that throughout the pandemic, a lot of folks have been delaying getting immunizations because their family doctors were closed and even pharmacies for quite a long while halted any sort of services where we were close with patients. But now, um, you know, we have the information to do this safely and it's a real opportunity for pharmacists to fill that gap for patients and um, update their immunization records. And of course, if we can do two vaccines at one appointment, it certainly is more efficient for patients and for pharmacists uh, together. Yeah. So it's, it's safer for patients as well, like Nasty's recommending and like James said, because you're minimizing the number of encounters with the healthcare system, which could potentially put the patient at risk of exposure to COVID-19 through other pharmacy patrons or patients in a waiting room um, who are ill, for example, but you're optimizing that protection. So for pneumonia vaccines, you're making sure their lungs are nice and healthy. Um, for other vaccine preventable diseases, you're making sure they're up to date and protected so that we don't see outbreaks in the community, which again would impact the patient's health um, and the healthcare system's capacity. And so like James said, because we're using the, essentially the appointment-based model for flu shots, that gives us the opportunity in advance when we screen patients um, for things like COVID and complete their consent forms, um, we can also screen for other things like other adult immunizations. We see um, the opportunity here to then fax a prescriber if it's a schedule one vaccine or a schedule two vaccine where the patient requires a prescription in order to get private coverage. We have kind of the luxury here of faxing the prescriber in advance with making a recommendation and then having the vaccine available for the patient when they come in for their flu shot. So you can administer one, two, three, even four vaccines, that's okay, on the same day. If you're doing two vaccines, it's recommended to use two different limbs. If that's not possible for whatever reason, just try to separate the injection site by about two and a half centimeters or an inch. And so some big ones that you might see um, are things like influenza and meningitis B or HPV for adults 15 to 25 plus. You might see influenza and pneumonia or influenza and herpes zoster for adults 50 plus or even 65 plus. And then you might see for pregnant patients that you're recommending a Tdap vaccine because we know that the recommendation is one pertussis vaccine every pregnancy between gestational weeks 27 and 33. The only thing that I'd like to call out here is to make sure that in your province, uh, these vaccines are within your scope of practice. So in Ontario, for example, the Tdap vaccine is not within the pharmacist's scope of practice. So make sure you know what is within your scope of practice and immunize within it or get a medical directive or direct order set up. And also make sure that you know if it's a schedule one vaccine like herpes zoster or schedule two vaccine uh, like pneumonia, because uh, that'll dictate if you need a prescription or not. Yeah, and one thing I'll add is we're getting, a, we get a lot of questions around what do I do if for a, it's a vaccine in a series. So if you look at herpes zoster where it's two injections, we had a lot of patients late to receive their second dose. So even if you're, you're more than a year late, you still give that second dose and you don't need to restart the series. So that's a, an important comment I'll add on here for folks that are really keen on optimizing immunizations. <clears throat> So I'm going to get into a, a number of operational considerations, and these come from um, the Canadian Pharmacists Association put together a really um, strong resource on best practices for flu season. So a lot of this comes directly from there. So for more information, please uh, check out those resources from CPHA because they're quite good and uh, helpful. So the first thing that we want to point out this year with doing things differently is walk-in immunizations are strongly discouraged. So there's a whole lot of um, considerations that we need to follow to make sure that patients are spaced appropriately, that you have even vaccine in stock and all of this can be done appropriately. So 
it's very much discouraged to have any uh, walk-in immunizations in particular as well, because now we, we're in a climate of COVID, you also need to do some pre-screening for COVID symptoms. So um, walk-ins are discouraged, use an appointment-based model. Consider um, special times for patients that are more vulnerable. So that could be elderly patients or patients with comorbidities. So patients with uh, like diabetes or breathing disorders, consider whether you can book those ones more like early morning when there's less traffic in the pharmacy or perhaps even after hours, staying some extra time to provide an extra safety for those patients away from the general pharmacy flow that comes through. There's some opportunities in different jurisdictions across the country this year to provide off-site immunization. So that may include um, community halls or visiting folks at their home, even doing shots on the front step or uh, retirement homes, for example. And we're seeing a lot of uh, temporary structures popping up in parking lots where pharmacists will come out to the tent and offer you your flu vaccine there or even drive-through models. And it's, it's very important that if you're engaging in any of these uh, alternative methods of providing flu vaccines that you're only providing them if your jurisdictions permit that. And we're going to get into later some of the monitoring requirements. So we'll, we will revisit drive-through later on. So stay tuned. <laughs> And if you're providing immunizations through a drive through model or even in an in-pharmacy model, it's advised to tell patients to arrive wearing um, clothing that would allow for easy access to the injection site. So not coming in with a jacket and coming in with short sleeves already rolled up. The reason for this is that we don't want patients to have to pull something over their head that could potentially displace or touch their mask. Um, and we don't want them to have to touch uh, their clothes where they might be able to um, transfer some droplets uh, onto their sleeve. So we really want to ask them to come prepared. Um, I know this can be a bit challenging in the middle of winter when it's quite cold, but that would be the ideal situation so that they're ready to go and it reduces the time that they need to be in the pharmacy for the actual injection itself. Great. I'm going to try and pick up the pace a little bit because I see it's already 740. So um, these infection control measures, they also apply for other pharmacy services, so not necessarily just flu, but cleaning high touch areas at least twice a day. So you want to use a disinfectant. So that would be things like doorknobs or handles or debit credit pin pads, those sort of areas where people touch quite often. Any equipment that is shared um, by a patient or touched by a patient has to be cleaned after each use. So if you have patients filling out forms at the pharmacy and they're handling clipboards or pens, you'd have to clean those items before you would provide them to another patient. It's strongly advised to have alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizer stations. So particularly, um, especially when patients come in the door, you'd want to have one available for them right away and throughout the pharmacy additional stations. In the room where you're providing injections, you need to clean the surfaces that a patient may have um, come in contact with immediately after each encounter. So I would encourage having like bare minimum amount of equipment in that room and have non-porous surfaces so that you can easily wipe them down with like Lysol wipes or spray with bleach and wipe it off a diluted bleach solution between patients. And lastly, keeping a log of all of these procedures so that you can reflect on it and make sure that you're um, meeting the standards and that providing you're providing a safe space for flu season to provide these injections. When we talk about scheduling appointments, there's some recommendations to follow in particular, um, allotting about 15 minutes for each appointment. If you're doing a whole family, perhaps you would make that maybe 20 or 25 minutes. Immunizing a whole household together. So uh, if there's parents and a child, try and get the three of them to come together for that one appointment rather than three separate appointments. Um, they're all in a bubble together, so you may as well do them all at once. 
make use of scheduling um, technology. So if if you can use your website or use a third party solution, I'll direct you to a few of them in the coming slides. Um, or even, you know, using a more traditional model of a phone, like having your assistant or yourself booking appointments via phone with patients who require uh, flu vaccines. Providing reminders. So we'll talk a little bit about that, about what kind of conversations and reminders you'd want to provide patients on an upcoming slide, but um, making sure that once they're booked that they don't forget, because I think we're going to have patients booking multiple appointments across multiple pharmacies because there's a heightened interest in flu vaccine this year. So you might have cancellations and I'd hate to see you delay other patients receive vaccine because some patients got it elsewhere. And the last reminder around appointments is if there's only one patient getting that vaccine, make sure if they're bringing a support person, it's just one. Like I've, I know in past seasons, you get the whole family there in the counseling room supervising grandma getting her vaccine. But um, for this year, we need to just limit the number of people that are coming in, to, in for the appointment, but also into the pharmacy in general. So there's a few um, various technology systems out there that can help with the process and most of them offer some degree of um, you know having patients complete consent forms in advance some of them also help with the billing procedure integrating with Kroll so I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of each of them because it's outside of the scope of the webinar but here are some uh, great options for you to consider <clears throat> So I mentioned a little bit about pre-appointment planning. So it's important to um, have this pre-appointment um, conversation or uh, you could even email. I think if you actually have someone from your team speak with a the patient, they're more likely to follow the directions than receiving the directions by email or text. But an important step is to screen that patient if they have any symptoms of COVID-19. So if they have any difficulty with breathing or fever, for example, or they're a close contact of a confirmed case or recent travel abroad within the last 14 days, then you should not be inviting them in for a flu shot and you should delay until uh, at least two weeks. Planning to optimize the immunization encounter. So Tiana and I addressed that a little bit earlier. So screening what other vaccines the patient may uh, need and offering it and coordinating that so that you have prescriptions in place or even product in place to make that happen when the patient arrives. Completing paperwork in advance. So you might consider emailing screening forms out for patients so that they could complete them ahead of time and not linger in the pharmacy filling in forms. Um, or even email them back to you or um, before they come in so that you can obtain the consent ahead of time. And um, a lot of those solutions I mentioned earlier can support that sort of activity. There's a lot of different safety procedures that you'll be having in the pharmacy this year that we need to make patients aware of. So that might include wearing a mask when you come for your appointment, um, sanitizing your hands upon entry, and also describing modified procedures. So if you have designated waiting areas where the patients are going to have to wait for observation, or even designated spots to line up before you, you receive the injection um, that, per, that allow for physical distancing, or if you are asking patients to uh, alert the pharmacy that they're in the parking lot waiting, and then you text them or call them when it's their turn. So there's lots of opportunities to uh, communicate effectively with patients to streamline your process. And I think um, one thing Tiana and I were discussing, I don't know if Tiana, you wanted to mention it now. Yeah, one thing that, that James and I were discussing is to let patients know, even when you're providing the immunization service, that 
um, you can do something like taping down a mark on the floor at the six feet mark and let them know before you cross that line after you've prepared the vaccines that once you cross the line you'd ask them to kindly look away and avoid talking unless um, they're feeling unwell because you want to again make sure that respiratory etiquette is maintained and that you protect yourself from them breathing on you as you're providing the immunization service and just letting them know out loud that that's going to be the procedure so that if they have any questions the time to ask is before you come within six feet. So I talked a little bit about COVID screening. So we can break it down into passive screening and active screening. Passive screening is something that the patient would read or do on their own. So that might include um, reading a sign posted outside the pharmacy asking them not to enter if they have symptoms or were a close contact, for example, of a COVID-19 confirmed case. Um, passive screening could also include emailing patients a survey ahead of time asking them about their symptoms before they would come to the pharmacy. So uh, there are some screening tools available and they're available through those um, technology solutions I shared earlier. Active screening would be someone from the pharmacy act being engaged with the patient and asking them questions or even uh, taking their temperature with an infrared thermometer. So if a patient um, has their temperature taken and they have a temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius, we would consider that a fail of active screening and you should uh, reschedule that immunization for when they no longer have a fever. So I wanted to touch a little bit about PPE because this is another one of those big questions. How do I protect myself and my team? What do we need? now that we're going to be getting closer to patients after being apart for so long. So um, on the screen you see from left to right, so that's the order you would put them on and then going the other direction is the order you would take them off. So we call putting on donning and doffing is when you're taking them off. So if you were wearing a gown, you would put that on first, followed by your face mask, then your eye protection, which could be a face shield or goggles. And then lastly, gloves if you are wearing them, but I'm going to explain here some cases where you may not be wearing some of these pieces. So gowns are not required if you are doing um, one-off immunizations, you don't need to wear a gown. However, if you are doing like a four-hour block <coughs> of injections, you might want to consider wearing it for sessional use. So if you're doing immunizations for a few hours and you have quite a few appointments, I would probably wear one myself in that sort of scenario. Surgical or procedural masks and eye protection are both required. So I have been seeing some pharmacists doing flu shots this year without eye protection. However, it is uh, part of the required or strongly recommended personal protective equipment. So I would encourage everyone to wear either goggles or a face shield. And lastly, we have gloves, which are only required for when you're providing intranasal vac vaccines. So that would be flu mist. You can certainly wear gloves if you can find them for other vaccines, but only required for flu mist. Yeah, the other important thing to point out about personal protective equipment is in the event of a post immunization adverse event, requiring a pharmacy team member to provide first aid or CPR to a patient, that would be a case for full PPE would be required. So you wanna make sure that your staff is trained and there are supplies available in the pharmacy, um, even a small kit of them, so that pharmacy members could don this and then provide aid to the patient since they will be in quite close contact and potentially for an extended amount of time. So a big question for pharmacists is around observation periods this year. So do I have to keep that patient in my pharmacy for 15 minutes and monitor them? And there's been different things happening around the world with monitoring periods. So I think it was Australia shortened observation periods or waived them altogether. And um, here in Canada, we're not being quite so liberal. So our NACI recommendations um, require patients still be monitored for 0 to 15 minutes post-vaccination 
if you have the physical space to do it. So if you can space patients out, if you have stations for them to wait and be monitored, you're encouraged to have those patients wait for 15 minutes because we know that the most serious reactions to an immunization do occur typically within the first five minutes. And if we have them wait for 15 minutes, we would typically capture the majority of those adverse reactions. However, uh, you can consider shorter observation periods if you're in a situation where physical distancing is not possible and the patient has received an influ influenza vaccine before. So if this is their first influenza vaccine, you should not be letting them leave early. You have to monitor them the whole 15 minutes. If they have reported no known or severe allergic reaction to any component in the vaccine, if they have had no severe reactions to any vaccines in the past. So that would include fainting or seizures or of course anaphylaxis. So if, if they haven't had that, if they're not planning to operate a motor vehicle and they're quite generous with motor vehicles. So it included rollerblades as well as a car, a bike, a scooter. So if they're planning to use any sort of transportation away from the pharmacy, and they're the one operating that, you should keep them there 15 minutes and monitor them. If they are an adult and they have a chaperone who will monitor them for 15 minutes and they don't have any of these other concerns, then you may let them leave after five minutes. So I've been seeing a lot of chatter about drive-through flu shots and it has me a little bit concerned that some folks might be providing immunizations and letting patients drive off without having any monitoring at all. So we know from this guidance from NASI, if that person is the driver who received that vaccine, you should be monitoring them at least 15 minutes or having at least someone from the team monitoring them in case something happens. You would not want them to be behind a vehicle. So on the note of um, events that could occur post immunization, um, we want to keep an eye out for anaphylaxis like James has mentioned. So the telltale signs of this can be things like cardiovascular symptoms. It can be things like uh, symptoms of the skin. So things like urticaria. It can be respiratory presentations. So shortness of breath um, or feeling like wheezing or tightening of the throat or lip area, some angioedema. And it can also classically present with a bit of a feeling of doom or anxiety on top of potentially confusion um, and disorientation from the patient. So look out for things like this when you're monitoring. Um, it might even um, start presenting as that dizziness um, but then uh, start uh, presenting more like a traditional anaphylaxis. Because of this, we want to make sure that epinephrine auto injectors are on hand for pharmacy use when providing injections. So we don't want to dispense everything we have available for patients who might have just recently gone back to school um, or be restocking their supplies that expired. We need to make sure that we have um, adequate supplies, both of uh, pediatric uh, doses and higher doses for patients who are heavier um, or adults uh, mm -hmm. available on hand. Yeah, that's actually really good advice, Tiana. And I know we were chatting about it earlier, how, um, you know, past flu seasons, we've had rampant back orders on epinephrine auto injectors. And we had seasons where there was only one alternative on the market, so one option. And an operational tip that I have for stores is that um, put those auto injectors you need to support your flu emergency kit aside. And then every time you reorder for your regular filling, rotate your inventory so that the ones from the kit come out onto the shelf and your new stock goes into the kit so that you always have the um, freshest expiries in your kit. So you're not expiring your, your auto injectors and wasting that way. So I'm gonna launch a second poll here. So did you know there are three epinephrine auto injectors available on the market here in Canada? So 
So hopefully you all can see the poll there now. So about half of the people that are on the call have answered so far. A few more seconds if anybody else wants to vote. All right, so I'm going to share the results. This is very interesting. So um, hopefully everybody can see the results. So. There are three um, auto injectors on the market now in Canada, and we're going to give you some information about them in the next couple slides because there's actually some very interesting considerations for the newest player around new dosing um, that we'll review. So it looks like you know 67% of the folks on the call weren't aware of that. And I think it's it's reasonable to be unaware of this because of uh, the different brands coming in. Sometimes we even have to go to the states to get kind of an emergency supply when there have been back orders in the past. Um, and because one of these players, Emirate, is actually brand new. So just uh, in the last week or so coming onto the Canadian market and so starting to be available to order um, at some of the doses and, and some doses will continue to come onto market in the next little while. The, the big thing about this is traditionally there's been kind of two dosing categories. So we know that um, children less than 15 kilograms, we don't have an auto injector. We do call 911 to get them emergency aid. We then know that for people uh, who weigh between 15 and 30 kilograms, the 0 0.15 milligram dose, so this might be um, a junior or pediatric dose, uh, is recommended. And then traditionally for anyone over 30 kilograms, so that's adolescents and even older adults, um, the recommended doses that have been available is 0 0.3 milligrams. But we know that over 30 kilograms represents a lot of Canadians and a lot of different sizes. And we know that the Canadian consensus um, from experts, the recommendation is actually to use a 0 0.01 milligram per kilogram dose um, up to a maximum of 0 0.5 milligrams in adults and 0 0.3 milligrams in children per dose. So we're actually seeing that in patients who are over 60 kilograms, there's the new Emerine um, option of 0 0.5 milligrams that aligns more closely with the Canadian expert consensus for these patients. And so when you think about it, 60 kilograms is, is not a lot. It's about 132 pounds, I think. Um, so that represents a lot of patients where the higher dose for them when they're experiencing anaphylaxis uh, may help um, ensure that they do survive that reaction um, and that they uh, get the amount of epinephrine that they require. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting and I'm, I'm excited to have a third option for epinephrine on the Canadian market after years and years of shortages. So I'm hoping this will be a solution for that. And I, I know, see on the slide that we included the Emory 0.15 milligrams. I don't think that one's quite out in Canada yet, but you should be able to see the 0.3 and the 0.5 milligrams in your wholesalers. And the last thing I wanted to mention is like when considering which patient you use which dose, I know there's some considerations for like elderly or frail patients or patients with known cardiovascular disease, you might not want to start them with that 0.5 milligram, maybe stick with the the more historical 0.3 milligram, but if you have a younger, healthier, larger patient, um, perhaps it's more appropriate to start on that 0.5. So if you give me my flu shot and I have a bad reaction, I'll be looking which one you give me. <laughs> so we're going to get into the landscape of vaccines available across Canada, and it's this is something that always irks me about Canada is how healthcare is not equitable across the country. Um, but um, so we have here in Ontario and also in PEI this year, I think it's the first time for both provinces where the high dose 
influenza vaccine is available for seniors living in the community. So pharmacy is playing a role uh, in providing publicly funded high dose vaccine in those provinces. However, the rest of the country is still most, the high dose is mostly limited to long-term care settings or personal care homes. I know uh, Manitoba also is providing it to certain correctional facility patients. So largely um, in those other provinces, pharmacy may have a small role if they're involved in servicing long-term care facilities, but for the most part, um, it's only Ontario in PPPEI where publicly funded high dose vaccine is available. If we look at flu mist, um, there are a few provinces um, to address the question that came up earlier uh, that do have flu mist available in the publicly funded plan, and that is PEI and British Columbia. They do have flu mist available at pharmacy for patients for pediatrics. And Quebec, I understand it's some pharmacies, but not all pharmacies that have it available. And the only other province that purchased flu mist or territory, I should say, for public plans is Yukon. So it, it was only purchased for public plans in four jurisdictions. So um, that gets us to, um, can I provide these vaccines? So if you're in one of those provinces that doesn't have high dose flu vaccine or doesn't have flu mist available at the pharmacy, or even if you do and you can't get it, if there's not enough supply, but you could purchase some, how would you provide those vaccines for patients? So influenza vaccines we know are schedule two. So that means they don't require a prescription technically. So if you have a cash paying customer that would like to purchase a flu zone high dose vaccine that you purchase from your wholesalers, so not part of the public supply or similarly a flu mist, well then you could uh, provide that vaccine and charge the patient. Some private insurances do require a prescription. So if the patient was planning to submit that for their insurance or to um, a healthcare spending account, it might be prudent for them to check whether they require a prescription or not. And certainly if you were billing it from the pharmacy, you would. And also consider some of the operational considerations, like if you were to uh, provide flu mist, I think they come in a box of 10. So can you find around 10 patients so you're not losing money? And also flu zone comes in a pack of five, I believe. Tiana, did you want to address the question that came up earlier around, um, is flu mist something still worthwhile to offer patients or is that kind of passe? Yeah, so I think um, we want to have this in our toolbox, especially for patients where that needle phobia really will prevent them from getting immunized. Um, if it's the only thing that will get them immunized, then we want to make sure that option's available. This is especially important, again, in a season where I know whole health, for example, tends to use the distraction technique, which we've seen in published literature helps with reducing that perception of pain. And, and we use virtual reality glasses, but in this year, unfortunately, we can't use the glasses because of that risk of transmission. And so for um, people who otherwise wouldn't be immunized, um, have, having flu mist available um, can really make the difference in making sure they're protected. So I see a question from James. James um, there's a question actually, uh, I think a really good one from uh, Raheem in Ottawa about other province patients, specifically in his case in Quebec. And you know, can we can we vaccinate those patients? And if we if we do, are we allowed to bill for that? Yeah, that's a really good question because those things are separate, <laughs> billing and vaccinating. So. Um, if I can probably take the billing one if you want. <laughs> so if, if the patient was living or working in Ontario, so if they're a student here and they live here or they're, they're working and they're residing in Ontario, so this would not apply if they just crossed the border and tried to access our vaccine supply. Um, if they were residing or working in Ontario and could provide proof, you could give them the vaccine 
but no, you cannot bill for it. Um, you could offer them um, private vaccine. So if you wanted to order, let's say it's a senior from Quebec, and you could get a high dose flu zone uh, package of vaccine. Yes, you could sell it to them, potentially bill their insurance if they had private insurance. But you could not, uh, you could not give them the public supply unless they were living in Ontario. James, I, I'll just, you know, there's a little bit of an asterisk on that one because uh, just from experience between the various provinces, James is 100% right. Under normal circumstances, you can't. Rahim, if you developed a clientele that had a lot of um, uh, RAMQ patients coming to your pharmacy, most provinces will at least consider it. You know, and I look to uh, provinces like Alberta and BC where there's some um, there's some border restrictions around you know what's the closest town as you sort of go back and forth between provinces. Um, being that it's Ottawa versus Quebec, I am not sure that that would be allowed, but there's always an opportunity for a pharmacist to actually seek coverage through the public plan in, in an adjoining province. Most times it's not okay, but if you do have a, a stream of patients that perhaps wanted RAMQ coverage, um, that is something worth exploring. Yeah, Tiana, there was a question around the scope of practice with influenza vaccines in Ontario outside of the public plan. And it was asking if that is within our scope to provide um, vaccines here in Ontario, influenza vaccines to, privately. And I believe influenza is on the list of vaccines we can provide. Do you agree with that? Yeah, so influenza vaccines are within the, the list of the 13 vaccines plus influenza vaccines in Ontario that's within a pharmacist's scope of practice to administer. Um, pharmacists in Ontario can administer intranasal um, vaccines through that route as well. So just do check your specific jurisdiction to make sure that you can do not only injectable but intranasal um, and that influenza is within your scope of practice. And then influenza vaccines are considered Schedule II by NAPRA. Um, some provinces have more strict uh, recommendations than NAPRA does. So again, be aware of what your province recommends, but overall um, NAPRA is uh, scheduling a Schedule II, so not requiring a prescription. Although again, prescription might re be required for private coverage um, if it's being used outside of public plans. Yeah, but as Tiana mentioned earlier, some families might be happy to pay. So it, like I think uh, a flu mist is around $40 a dose, so they might be quite happy to immunize their children uh, if your province doesn't have it as part of their public plan and they couldn't quite work up the courage to have their kids take needles this year. And I can see that because I think this year all the extra layers of safety that are happening might be scary for a child to go into a pharmacy and see the pharmacists wearing all of this biohazard equipment. So we're going to transition into the next session, which is called What's New with Flu? Um, so we're going to talk about a few things happening in different provinces. So when we look at Alberta, I just wanted to get it on the radar for the Alberta pharmacists listening in that there are um, some changes with regard to reporting immunizations that take effect as of January 1, 2021, where you'll have to be recording immunizations and also the assessments to provide an immunization. If the patient um, ends up not qualifying for that immunization, you still have to report that. We're currently in the transition period and um, you have the option of either using aggregate data or submitting claims through Alberta Blue Cross for the this flu season. If your electronic submission functionality is not available, um, you can submit manually your aggregate data every month. And if there's an immunization provided to a child nine years of age and under, there's an additional form you need to fill in. And this applies to both provincially funded immunizations, but also 
privately purchased vaccines. So if you get into offering high dose flu vaccines outside of your provincial publicly funded vaccines, you would also have to report those. If you have any patient experiencing an adverse reaction, and these are the more serious adverse reactions that Tiana described earlier on when she's talking about anaphylaxis, um, those type of reactions would need to be reported as well within three days. So here in Ontario, a big announcement that came was the ability of pharmacists to provide immunizations or flu shots, I should say, outside of the physical pharmacy premises, but within the boundaries of your public health unit. And there's a, a web, there's a link on the page that takes you to a site where you can map out exactly where your pharmacy is and what are the boundaries of your public health unit. So on the screen there you see Whole Health Compounding Pharmacy in Ottawa, shout out to Renew, and it has his public health boundaries. So it's quite a large area. So if you are able to secure the vaccine and you have um, a community group out there that's interested in having you come provide the service, you can certainly go ahead and do that. You'd have to maintain like cold chain and documentation and all of the monitoring that you would typically do with vaccines at your pharmacy, but you're welcome to go out and do this at retirement homes, religious institutions, community centers in your parking lot, for example, which most of those options were not available last year. You cannot, however, um, immunize hospital inpatients or residents of licensed long-term care facilities. This is a big year for Newfoundland pharmacies. It's the first year where they've had a universal influenza program at pharmacy. I think before they were dabbling on more narrow lists of who they could immunize. However, their uh, Minister of Health has come out and expanded this program uh, more broadly. And they're quoted saying, I al it also wouldn't be out of the ordinary to see a waiting line in pharmacies since pharmacists can give the shot. Well, I hope Newfoundland pharmacies are listening and would know that it would be out of the ordinary because we're doing appointment-based flu shots this year. So we don't want to see lineups outside the pharmacy. Some very interesting things happening in Nova Scotia this year, and I already mentioned them, and that includes um, pharmacists immunization, immunizing as young as two years of age. That's the first for all of Canada, so congratulations, Nova Scotia. There's some good people come from there. And also pharmacy technicians for the first time this year will be providing immunizations on your delegation from pharmacists, and they're doing training throughout October and will be offering that service very soon. I'm seeing there's a question. Ooh. It's a long question. I guess we'll read that later. James, let's take that one at the end. I'll read it over. I just, you know, I thought, well, we're doing a bit of a cross-country swath. You know, one of the things that I will say to those of you that are practicing in Ontario, because, you know, I think we've all been very disappointed in the reimbursement for a long time at $7.50 per, um, per vaccine. Um, thought if any year was the year that we would actually qualify because most of the other provinces across Canada got a lift in their reimbursement on flu shots this year, specifically with the extra precautions with COVID. But uh, as I said, one of the most disappointing things um, around the advocacy position that OPA and others have taken is, is the fact that we did not get that increase. It was supposed to go to $11 a vaccine um, and unfortunately, um, it remains at 750. So, so I just wanted to kind of add those two cents in here, James. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, it's not really up for discussion. It's just more of an FYI for everybody. And uh, I'm going to save this question till the end. Uh, but back to you and Tiana. Yeah. So we're getting towards the end of this presentation. Just a few final considerations. So this organization, MyFluShot.ca, they are partnering with Immunize Canada to create a national flu shot locator. And 
they're telling me they will have a coinciding public awareness campaign as well. So it's free for pharmacies to list themselves on the website. If you want to take advantage of some of the higher level functionality, you would have to pay for that. But I think every pharmacy that's providing flu shots should at least list themselves on the website so that patients who are directed there will know their, their options in the community and can find you. And here's an example of what it would look like when the patient uh, searches pharmacies around them providing the vaccine. So for example, here's Oshawa showing our Intrepid Pharmacy there that's part of Whole Health Pharmacy as a, an option in the community to get the flu shot. Question that um, Tiana and I are getting often from stores or commentary from stores is that I've received some vaccine, I'm all out, and I have 200 patients waiting. When can I get more vaccine? So I'm going to address that for two provinces where we have the majority of our pharmacies. So that's Ontario and Alberta. So as you know, Ontario pharmacies have been receiving initial shipments between October 5 and up to October 19, which would include about half of the doses you gave last year. And um, more widespread community clinics are not permitted until the 19th. However, if you were, if you had like a high risk group, like maybe a local seniors group, you could certainly go and do them because they would qualify under the high risk, but you wouldn't want to go and do a local baseball team until after the, the, the uh, launch on the 19th. Um, initial shipments included a breakdown of 80% the QIV and 20% the high dose TIV. And there's a recommendation or a caution, do not reorder on the 25th unless you've already used 60% because you might get flagged as um, kind of being, trying to get too much vaccine and they might block you from reordering for periods. So make sure that uh, you have used about half of your doses before you would reorder. And starting on the 25th, which is a Sunday, you can reorder for next day delivery through McKesson Wholesaler for uh, the stores that are ordering through McKesson, which is, I think, everyone except for shoppers. And um, yeah, so the big question mark that we don't have a lot of clarity around is when you're reordering, how much will you be able to reorder? And will you be able to order enough of a particular vaccine, say if you wanted only high dose, will you be able to get high dose or will you mainly be getting the quadrivalent standard dose? We don't really have the answer yet and we will certainly share that as soon as we have some clarity with our source. When we look at Alberta, the, um, they're a little bit ahead with some of the initial shipments started back in September and they can start to reorder as early as October 18th. And we're told that their orders will be capped at 30 units or 300 doses. I would certainly look at um, how many appointments you have lined up. And if you don't have the need for 300, I would not order 300 um, because then that could have consequences. You don't want to have a lot of vaccine left over at the end of the season. So some of the key points that we talked about was really encouraging appointment-based flu service for this year, ensuring physical distancing measures are in place at the pharmacy so that you can do this safely, utilize active and passive screening to check if the patients have symptoms of COVID-19 or close contacts with confirmed cases or recent travel abroad preparing the PPE that you will require. So um, as you know, some, some elements you might need uh, sessionally and you might be able to reuse, for example, goggles, but if you're using uh, gowns, you might need a gown or two per day. And so you can do the math and get ahead of it and get that inventory in place. But an important message is try and have conversations with patients so that they're not delaying and delaying getting a flu vaccine unnecessarily, waiting for something that may not come into stock. We don't know exactly how 
certain vaccines will be available throughout the program for the next few months. So I wouldn't delay waiting for one particular vaccine if you have a suitable vaccine available. And lastly, optimize the encounter. And we're hearing a lot of positive feedback from whole health pharmacies that are doing this, where they provided a pneumonia vaccine or a shingles vaccine or even uh, other vaccines at the same appointment where they're offering flu vaccines. And we have some really great examples of folks on our teams getting ahead of this and making appointments and coordinating 10 patients getting their pneumonia vaccines. So it's a real opportunity to make a difference to protect patients this year beyond just flu. So we're going to take some questions. I'll remind folks on the line, if you don't follow us already, please go to our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter. We do a lot of sharing things for the pharmacy community. So please look at those pages. Yeah, and one of the first questions that I actually see is going back to um, epinephrine dosing actually. And, and someone actually is letting us know that they've actually seen Allerject um, at the higher 0 0.3 milligram dose, even for kids over the weight of 25 milligrams, um, rather than uh, waiting for the higher dose. And I think this comes down to different expert opinions, as well as different recommendations. We even see this in um, older adults. So some guidelines recommend like we did the over 60 kilogram dosing for the 0.5 milligram dose, but we have actually seen the 0.5 milligram dose recommended even for individuals 50 kilograms and above. So it does uh, vary a little bit in terms of the reference and the expert you're speaking with um, as to how aggressive of a dose you might use. And, and again, thinking of uh, the patient and potential other things that would come into account, like if they're pregnant, um, if they're elderly, or if they have cardiac comorbidities, then maybe we might be uh, less aggressive on that dose. But otherwise, um, some people will push it even more than what we recommended in our slides. Yeah, so maybe um, I think we're well overdue. Perhaps we should be having some final remarks from Dean and then we can say goodnight to all the folks on the line. Yeah, I'd just like to remind everybody, I mean, it is the final chance for any last question. I mean, uh, we've kind of been answering them as we go. Um, but I'm just going to hang on for one minute here, but I don't see anything coming in. I hope, uh, hope we don't cut anybody off. But um, James and Tiana, thank you very much for, for putting this together. Um, I think, boy, if we didn't cover it all with this presentation on flu, I don't know uh, what would. So, so thank you very much for putting it all together. Um, once again, everybody, I just want to thank you all for letting us uh, uh, into your homes uh, to, um, to talk a little bit about flu tonight. This is something we do on a regular basis at Whole Health. We, um, we enjoy doing them. We tend to have a mixture of webinars related to professional issues of, uh, for pharmacists, educational issues for pharmacists, and also business um, uh, you know, business issues for pharmacy as well. So, so as I said, we're kind of kicking off our web, webinar year um, and uh, there's lots more to come. We have a lot more planned for the remainder of 2020 and into 2021. Lots of in interesting topics that I hope you're going to all enjoy. Uh, once again, this was recorded on Facebook Live. I mean, a lot of times we get requests afterwards for a recording um, to share with staff and whatnot. So it has been recorded, um, whether it be James or Tiana or myself, we'd be happy to, to help you out with any questions you might, uh, you might have. Once again, this was a cross country broadcast. Um, Whole Health, for the most part up to 2020 has been a banner as James explained that has been very Ontario based. And um, just a, a heads up for those of you in Western Canada that, uh, it's a big focus point for 2021 and beyond. 
So, uh, so watch for a lot more information coming from Whole Health. And for the people in Atlantic Canada, that doesn't mean you're excluded. As James mentioned, we have our first kind of flagship Whole Health Pharmacy opening in Moncton coming up, uh, which is pretty exciting for all of us. And uh, actually, I think Andrew was on the call tonight. So Andrew, a shout out to you um, out in Moncton there tonight. Um, and again, just on my behalf, just I just wanted to thank say thank you to everybody. Um, there's lots of links up there where you can find us. Um, once again, James, Tiana, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everybody and have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs>